Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for always sending your word to us to gather us back to you. That no matter what we do and say, you still desire us. You still come after us and desire us to be with you. We thank you for the mercy that you've shown us in Jesus to that end. Now we ask your blessing upon our Bible study that what we learn from that very same word may enliven us, strengthen our faith, and give us zeal to share your word with those that you place in our lives. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Proverbs. So you should have your half sheet handout has the questions there from Proverbs. Um, I really wanted to write a lot more, but I remember that this was the Bible study about Proverbs. <laughs> that this is just supposed to be a biblical literacy introduction. So we will, I, I will say right now on record, we're not going to be doing this 45 minutes from now. Um, like we got sucked into Job a couple of times. So, um, so if you do have like uh, questions in addition to these, please feel free to ask. Um, and we'll go from there. Okay. So uh, just as a sidebar here for the first question, something that uh, if you've never invested in, I would highly recommend investing in a study Bible. Our synod puts out a couple of nice ones, a Lutheran study Bible. Um, obviously, it would probably be the best for us. Um, there are also other good study Bibles as well, but um, you'll get a nice shake about the Lutheran take on some of these scripture passages. Plus, they have a really nice thing about, they have like nice introductions to each book of the Bible. I give you Luther, some of Luther's thoughts on that book that talk a little bit about the authorship and the setting and all of that stuff. Um, so just a little plug there. I highly recommend it. I find them extremely useful. Um, and I learn things when I read the study notes. So, uh, so yeah, okay. So with that in mind, what is the setting for the book of Proverbs? What, what is the setting for the writing of these Proverbs? <laughs> Solomon is giving instruction and wisdom to his son. Yeah, so it's a father giving instruction and wisdom to his son. Now, there are certain sections in Proverbs that aren't explicitly a father-son thing, but in general, the, the setting is the elder is giving teaching advice to the younger. Right? In preparation for what? Life, right? Life, and what sort of life? Doing Christ in life. What? Doing right. Yes. Doing right. Very good. Living a good life by and good as defined by God. Right. And that includes some exhortations, but it also includes some warnings because does the world make it easy to live a good life? No. It does not. Right. So there's lots of temptations and things that want to draw you away from the good. So how does that setting help us understand how we read the book of Proverbs? Well, it goes beyond the how. Raise your hand, Pete. It goes beyond the how to. More than just practical, practical, just in the context of the God please. Yeah, so it's it's not just the how to. It goes beyond just the practicalities. It's in the context of real life. Yeah, Pete. It's good and profitable, and and for his his son's benefit. It's good and profitable, and for his son's benefit. Which it's also not possible at all. Yes, <laughs> right. It's, it's much more uh, law-leaning. It is law-leaning because it's talking about what? It's a word that starts with an end. Often we reduce our Bible stories to these, but in Proverbs, that's basically what they are. Morals, Morals right? Um, so that's why, like, when I do children's messages, I pretty much always make sure I include what? Morals. No. The gospel. Because I don't want it to just be a moralistic story. Because when you do that, then you stop paying attention to the fact that Jesus really did exist. And he really did die on the cross for your sins. He's just a representative of a story that's supposed to teach you certain things. Right? Now, he does. But it's, he's not, our faith is not just morals. Um, so in the book of Proverbs, there's not a lot of gospel. Is there like a lot of direct command? 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. There and they so there's a mix of command and then a mix of like this is generally how this works. So I would advise you to not do this or to do that right? um, because uh, as well as everybody knows, like let's just do the father son thing. What happens when your son is 18 and leaves the house? Worry. You worry. <laughs> yeah, you lose control, right? You can't, you can no longer call up your son. At, well, you can try, it will not work. You can call your son at college and say, clean your room, son. Right? Why is that? Do what? You're not there, is one. And has your relationship with them changed? Yes. Yeah, it has, right? And in a good way, but in a scary way. Because we like it when we can just do the do this, do that, do this, right? Um, and so part of what Proverbs does is it doesn't just give direct commands. It also gives exhortations based on life experience. That's why it's called the book of wisdom, right? How do you accrue wisdom? Living, right? Doing some things right and some things not so right, right? And then you say, hey. Don't step on that rake. It turns out it flies up and smacks you in the face. <laughs> um, so this is why some of these things, they're not necessarily like do A and then B will happen. They're general observations about the way life works. So if this is if this end goal is your desire, then you go about life in this way. It's not a guarantee that that's going to happen. Right? It's not saying if you do A, then B will happen. It's saying if you do A, B will likely happen because this is the way life works, right? But there are exceptions to those. So it's not, it's not on the same level as like the 10 commandments is basically what I'm saying, right? There aren't any exceptions to the rule, you shall not steal. That's pretty cut and dry, command from God, and there's no way around it, right? Um, but some of the things said in here, if you do this, then this, they're not of that same order where they're saying, if you do A, then B will happen, I promise. Okay. Yeah, it's it's benefit, advice, counsel, um, exhortation based off life experience. Okay. Uh, and that's all built into the setting of, I mean, think about it. When you're a parent trying to teach your kid, there's some command, the direct command, right? When they live in your house, clean your room. If you don't clean your room, then this will happen. And you can pretty much guarantee that it will, right? But you can also, there's also involved in that, this is the way life works. So if you want this to happen, then you need to do this. But then they might come back and say, mom, I did that. And this did not happen because it doesn't always work out that way, right? So, so Proverbs fills in that setting quite nicely with the way that it exhorts to action and teaches a good life, right? Any questions about that setting? Okay. Question number two, according to Proverbs, what is the beginning of knowledge? Fear of the, Lord. the fear of the Lord. What the heck does that mean? Absolute reverence. Reverence. Okay. Is that what the word fear means? In that sense. Why do you say in that sense? We are not called to be terrified. However, knowing God's power that he could smote us at any given moment if he so choose. That sounds like terror to me. Right. We are, are, and that's why it's an absolute reverence, because it totals all of God's power, authority, sovereignty. I'm going to push back the against the interpretation of fear of the Lord as reverence. I don't like saying reverence because then people don't think that you're not also supposed to be terrified of God. You are supposed to be terrified of God. You made yourself an enemy of God. Not a great place to be, right? So when, when the angels show up and they have to say, do not fear, they're not saying that as like, don't worship me. They're saying, don't pee your pants. Like, don't <laughs> run away. Don't just like pass out, right? Um, and it, so God is that multiplied indefinitely, right? So when he comes to his prophets, and they're afraid. They're not just like reverencing God. 
they become acutely aware because they're in the presence of the Almighty that they are a sinner and that he would be totally justified in erasing them from existence. Right. So, and, and that's just something that we have to come to terms with in our relationship with God. Now, we, we aren't just terrified of God because what has he revealed once he shows up? Love, right? But not love without just, not without justice, right? Now, the love gets, the love swallows up the justice in the person of Jesus, but the justice still had to be done, right? Why, oh, why, God, have you forsaken? He, forsake Jesus, he forsook Jesus because that was what you deserved. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Think about that for a moment because there's something that you confess in the creed every week that we often forget about Jesus. The role that he's going to play. What is it? Judge. He's going to be the one judging the living and the dead when he comes again, right? And so the reason I'm kind of emphasizing this is not to, not to like freak you out in an inordinate sense, but to remind you that Jesus is not just the guy holding the sheep and the little children in the pictures you've seen. He's also the guy with the whip of cords driving people out of the temple for being irreverent in the house of God. He's also the guy, well, all the, all the authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. He's also the guy who will come back and judge the living and the dead. Right? And by that mean that what that phrase means, in case you haven't really thought about it before, is that those who are not believing in Jesus, he will judge to hell. Okay, when the Bible talks about don't fear those who can only destroy the body, fear the one who can destroy the body and the soul, it's not talking about the devil, it's talking about God. Okay. I, I think one of the more poignant pieces in the New Testament that shows fear of God is Peter in the boat, and I can't remember whether it was whenever they uh, picked up all the fish or whenever Jesus calmed the storm, but as soon as Peter realized that Jesus was more than just a man, that he was God, he immediately fell to his knees and, and realized his lowly position. Yeah. yeah, that's the fish story, and he even says, says depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Right. Um, so, there is, there's two elements to the fear of God. It's a, it's a fear tempered by love because of what he reveals once he arrives. But the presence of God, it's not an accident that the presence of God creates fear. It creates fear because we have been put at odds with him by our sinful nature. Right? So I think it'll be, un, it's unmistakable to you, I think, if you're in the presence of God, where you stand. There's no, no use pretending otherwise. Yeah, we also have to remember that uh, our fear of him is due to the fact that we are just in so much in awe. It's beyond our understanding. And there's no way we can totally comprehend his power and glory and, and might. Sure. Yeah, so there's, there. I guess you could say there's two elements to the fear, right? One is, is you're in the presence of a being beyond your comprehension, right? So that's the awe. And then in the context of the gospel, that's the reverence. Um, but in the context of the law and in the knowledge of your own sin, it is a terror because this is the person you have made, this is the being that you have made yourself an enemy of. I think C.S. Lewis, well, of course, I love your Christianity. And it was what, that was actually one of the first things I read that brought me to faith. Um, but when I was reading uh, the Narnia series to my kids, that's when I really got how scary. I figured, well, now I'm not God's enemy, so there's nothing to be afraid of. So I never even considered fear. But before I was a Christian, I didn't know enough to be afraid. And then once I became a Christian, I figured I didn't have to be afraid. So fear never entered the, then I would have Aslan, you know, not at all safe. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, you know, just just throughout all seven books, you kind of get how um, not at all safe. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, 
and I would say if you haven't read the Chronicles of Narnia since you were a child, you should read them as an adult. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's a completely different. It, it's, a, it's a much better story for adults. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, that's one of my favorite lines from the whole series. I actually have a plaque of it in my office. Oh, wow, uh, is uh, that the the, the the context of it for those who haven't read it or don't remember is the children are asking about Aslan and they say, "Is he safe?" To which the response is, "Safe." Of course, he's not safe, right? but he is good. Right? Uh, because what we're interested in is security, right? particularly because we know that there's reasons why maybe we're not so secure. And especially if we're going to come into the presence of a being that's far outside the power of ourselves, we want to know, OK, what's going to happen when I get him? Is he safe? Right? Um, God's not safe. If God is just, if God is loving, right? And so the gospel tempers that fear with the love of Christ. Right? So the judgment of God, the wrath of God, which that's really what we're talking about when we're saying that we there is a substitution that occurs. Like all the terror that comes with being an enemy of God that was meant for you was poured out on Jesus in your place. That's why he cried out, why, oh God, have you forsaken me? Okay. So that's what it means that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, essentially, I what I take that to, like the way I internalize that is, is it's a reminder of what and who you are, the station you, you hold in creation. You are automatically unwise if you think you are something other than a human creature under the care of God. And now that we live in a fallen world and are fallen creatures ourselves, that's the state we're in, right? And so the fear of the Lord factors into that as well, right? So in a sense, this is saying that the fear of the Lord, recognizing who and what you are in relation to God and where you stand is the beginning knowledge the gift of wisdom, right? And this is repeated a lot throughout the book of Proverbs. Okay. All right, third question. Is the wisdom of Proverbs different from worldly wisdom? What are some examples? There's a couple of real obvious ones in the first part. One in particular for the enlightened West that's very uh, anti-worldly wisdom. Well, let's first answer the, the, the initial question. Is the wisdom of Proverbs different from the world, from the world's wisdom? Yes, it is. Right? Just by that very first part. What does the world think of being afraid of God? It's for like weird people who believe in magic for the long time. Not wisdom. So the very starting point is is already leading us in a different direction, and that, that, that just saying that made me think of the the stone table. Now don't speak to me of the old magic. I was there when it was written. Um, but so, what are some examples of how this is different? So we have the the initial theme. There's a famous one uh, from Proverbs chapter three, verse four: Trust the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path does that sound like something you hear from the world no what, what might the if we were going to phrase that the way the world would say what might it well, how might it change trust in your heart trust in your believe heart. in yourself if believe it feels yourself. good do it yeah. um you know the goal is to be young and rich and beautiful you're perfect the way you are Sorry to break it to you. You're not. <laughs> but that's what the world says. Right? You don't need anybody. No, I, I don't need any help. I'm good on my own, right? So it might say, uh, don't trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your own understanding. And this is difficult even in the context of the Christian faith. What happens when we run into things like the Trinity and oh. communion and like the mysteries of God that are beyond our comprehension? Our temptation is always to twist it into a way that we can understand and explain it because our reason is the highest word. Right? 
That was one of the reasons, uh, no pun intended, that I stayed as a Lutheran as an adult. As I was a philosophy major at undergrad, so I talked about this stuff a lot, read lots of books by people who don't believe in God, trying to figure out the world and, and how to live the good life, right? And um, it all came up short. But there was always this temptation, and, you, and usually the criticisms, if you think about it, all the criticisms in the scripture usually centralize around these sort of disagreements, right? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, why would God do that? And when we start thinking in those terms and then applying the rules in those terms, what we're really saying is, God, you can't behave outside of, outside of my understanding and my reason. And if you do, I'm not going to believe you. If you do, you're wrong. So in, in, uh, in church, in different churches, you'll have people that believe that the uh, body and blood is, is a representative meal. The Lord's Supper is representation. It's not the real presence. And that stems from a clashing of reason and faith. That, well, I mean, it doesn't smell like blood or taste like blood. And like, he can't have meant, literally, this is my body, this is my blood. Well, why can't he have meant it? That's literally what he offered up on the cross for you. So why would that why would that not be? That's what it says, right? I think did I mention that last week the that the, the Ulrich and Luther thing and he just carved the word is into the table because he said, I'm just gonna take him at his word, right? And, and his reasoning was essentially the faith side of things, not the reason side. Like um, sort of the tongue-in-cheek response is, well, that guy was risen from the dead, so I'm gonna take his word for it. In other words, he's beyond me, and this is what he said, so I'm just going to believe. I'm not going to get lost in the particulars of how it works exactly, because then I end up raising up my reason to the level of God, and that's that's not how that works, right? And that's part of the lesson we learned from Job last week, too. You're, you're in the deep end of the pool. You're way out of your depth. <laughs> I like how Solomon sometimes showed how great worldly wisdom was and then twisted it and smacked him in the face and going, here's the folly. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah, reading from chapter five. Okay. And he's talking about the forbidden woman. He goes, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. And her speech is smoother than oil. You're like, oh, well, this sounds good. And then he goes, but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. And you're like, okay. I get your point, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, think about conversations that you have kids that you've had with your kids. They've probably gone along similar, similar lines, similar thought process, right? Like, well, that sounds fun or that looks fun, but here's what happens when you actually do it. Um, and so that that becomes a form of wisdom. And the reason that you know that is likely because you did it and that thing happened, or you saw somebody who did it and that thing happened to them, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think Proverbs is useful, though, because, I mean, I, I totally agree with the point, right, that, that we want to build up to the point where we, we understand it's, it's, it's not the world, like it's, it's counterintuitive, and it, and it leads us to the more advanced uh, the, theological topics. But, like, Proverbs is accessible because you don't have to understand the Trinity. You don't have to get to that point, right, to, to benefit. Sure. And a lot of it I look at as kind of a day two wisdom, right? It's like, okay, if the world, if the world's wisdom is like Oprah's ideas, like book of the day, and you know, it's like, okay, we're looking one foot in front. We're looking just a little bit. And okay, this might feel good. This might help your self-esteem. This might help just a little bit, you know. But then if you go day two, day three, day 10, you know, and that's what I think they lay out for us here. He's 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 talking about consequences. A lot of this is natural. I mean, most of these things are just, the, I, I think of as describing human nature and, and the way that, you know, how, how do you survive? Because ultimately it comes down to like chapter uh, chapter eight at the end, he's saying, where is it? Uh, for whoever finds me, finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. And, and the thing is that this stuff is very 
you know, if you've lived life, you're going to read this and it's going to resonate with you. Yep. And so I think of this also as kind of a gateway to say, hey, if, if you're going through a rough spot, if you want, if you want to get something outside of the, the modern view of, of right and wrong, you know, and then if, if we see this and we say, yes, this is right, this is true, it resonates, and then it's like, okay, it could lead, lead us a little, little deeper. Yeah, yeah, totally. I agree. That's sort of the, like the expression of why it's not just a set of rules, but it's an exhortation about life, but life oriented with God at the center, right? And so the, like the example you just gave, right, is God is saying, like, I'm the center of this whole thing you're a part of. So if you want to know what's going on, listen to me, come to me, right? Um, and that's what that, I mean, if you boil everything down to, to sort of one maximum, that's what life is about. Life is about God. It's not about you. It's not about your family. All those things are about God at some point, right? And that, that's sort of the centralizing principle of Proverbs. And it does have, I think what you're describing, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're describing is sort of the manifestation of the law written on the hearts. That the natural law that is born out in creation because it was created by God for a certain purpose to function in a certain way. So even if you don't quite yet understand or believe in God, if you've lived, I think what you're saying is if you live life, you can see the truth of what's being said here. Right. Like so if you if you if you chase after the wanton woman and you snub all your friends and you and you don't withhold your instant gratification, like it doesn't turn out well for you. And somebody who's lived life that way. Let's say, yeah, it really has not. Or it may look like it has, but there are certain emptinesses here, right? Um, and we see that in our popular culture as well, right? So um, the one that always stands out to me is, is the death of Robin Williams. It was such a shock to so many people. Because according to the world, what did he have? He had everything. He had everything, right? So according to the worldly wisdom of the good life, what did he have? He had the good life. He had the ultimate fulfillment of human experience and yet was empty. Um, and so maybe for somebody in those states, if they're open to it, Proverbs does have some words to speak because it can resonate with that natural experience. Yeah, Trish. I'm not a good follower by any stretch, but who is Solomon? Who is Solomon talking to? Is he talking to his son? Yeah. And we don't know who that is. Uh, it's likely a uh, rare bone, oh, okay. but get a lot of sun. Okay. But the the purpose of its in, inclusion, the reason it was written, the purpose of its inclusion in the scriptures is that that is sort of the the setting for which wisdom is being granted from from an older person who's experienced life to a younger person. Okay. So that's. Okay. And I think it's a model of what our homes should be. Yeah. That we should be teaching our children. Yep. Uh, and then I also, as I was reading the first nine chapters, I, I thought of, uh, you know, if you watch cartoons, the devil pops up on one shoulder, uh -huh. the pops up yeah, on the yeah. other, that, the, that, that wisdom and folly were sort of those angels, and they're both competing yeah. for you. Right. And then the adulteress is probably not just an adulteress. Everything that leads you away from God. Yeah. Yep. 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 Like it's not just a wanted woman. It's but it's, this is where the, the world. But this is where the setting is helpful because yes. if you're a young man, what is the most likely temptation that you're going to encounter that's going to lead you away? There's a reason that Solomon chose that particular example, right? But it does, it's not bound to that particular situation. Right? I agree. Um, but yeah, so um this is really like one of the reasons I got very passionate about family ministry um, is our churches are doing more than they've ever done in the history of the church as far as resources and time and programs for youth and children's ministry. When you go back 150 years, there wasn't even a Sunday school, there wasn't PBS, that we'd ever heard of a DCE or a youth pastor. Right? All of those things have happened in the last century. Or less. And yet, a lot of children that grow up in homes of faith don't stay in the faith. So where, where is the crisis at? Is it at the church or is it at home? 
but there's also a cultural fusion, I think, that the culture has adopted some churchy words. Yes. And can make it sound like it's not dangerous. Well, this is the the honey dripping from the lips, right? Right. And, and, and I it sounds and, nice and appealing. And I paid my vows and I did I like I'm I'm good. See, I'm good. Yeah. I, I I feel like it's um it's not so clear cut to the sun what's good and what's evil. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that is why this is such an important source of wisdom for the Christian household. This is why Luther felt so strongly about writing the small catechism when he did. Right? Is the way that, that individuals are going to learn and experience not just the doctrine of faith and, and the Bible, but life is primarily where? At home. I have a I have a shirt. That I wear sometimes it has a one over 167. And it's an it's an illustrative point for this, what we're talking about. For every one hour I spend with your kids, they spend 167 hours with you. So if they're only hearing about Jesus when I'm around, they're not gonna really hear about Jesus. Except they're not really spending 167 hours at home. Well, yeah. spending it with the world, most of those with the world. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was this was sort of calculated over the year. I don't think they included sleeping hours, but okay. like okay. where home is the primary, the primary shaping place, right? And so um, that that is one of the reasons that I, I I focus on that so strongly is like what we do here in this hour, or I do with the youth group when we go bowling or when we do a service project, doesn't mean a whole lot if they only have the mountaintop experiences. And then when they go home where their normal life lives, Jesus is not there. The Bible's not there. This wisdom that we're reading about is not spoken of or taught. But then they're going to find it somewhere because you got to live life somehow. That's part of what Proverbs is telling us, right? These things are going to happen. They're going to come upon you and you're going to wonder, what should I do? Where should I go? Who should I listen to? So if, if we see that ground, Somebody else is more than happy to take it because, as Janine pointed out, it's not, there's not just an angel on the shoulder. There's also a devil. Right? And he's not, if you stop talking, he's not going to go, oh, okay, well, I guess we're done. And he's going to start talking more. That image is sort of ruined for me from uh, the Emperor's New Groove. Now I only think of Crunk. But because um, he ends his argument by doing a handstand push ups, he's like, well, yeah, well, look what I can do. And the other guy's like, no, that actually is pretty impressive. Um, but are there any last questions about the Proverbs or insights before we go on to uh, baptism? Great. Okay. So for next week, uh, let's just do, because I think we don't really have like a new section section until I think about verse 20 or chapter 21. So why don't we do just our standard 10, so from 9 to 19. Or wait, we already read them, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry, 10 to 19. I always get confused with that because that's actually 10 chapters, but it sounds like it's only nine. And, yeah. and I want to congratulate you. It only was 40 minutes. Uh, oh, great. Okay. Well, we, did start, we did start, I think, about five or six minutes late today. After <laughs> then, you, then you only did 30. Hey, awesome. <laughs> We're getting better. We're getting better. So I, I was also just kidding about that. Okay. I do want to get through the rest of the catechism before May, though. So, 2022? <laughs> That's the idea. Well, you joke, but like there were some Greek professors at the seminary, one in particular, who taught a Bible study on Mark for like six years. So, because people, well, he's a Greek professor, so you could spend a whole time on like three words. So, okay, what is baptism? So before we get to the, the dictionary definition according to Martin Luther, give your best stab at the answer to that question. Flip your paper over so you can't see the answer, so you can't cheat. In your own words, what is baptism? Because catechesis, after all, is just questions and answers. What is baptism? Becoming a child of God. So if I've never heard of baptism, that's what you're going to tell me it is? Okay. All right. 
Jewish practice uh, originally. And uh, I think it was primarily for convenience of sin. <laughs> yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, what else? When the Holy Spirit enters us. Water and the Word. When the Holy Spirit enters us, okay. So we got uh, water and the Word when the Holy Spirit enters us. Originally, a Jewish practice centered around, um, well, centered around cleanliness in the Old Testament and then uh, became something else in the New. And it's when you become a child of God. Okay. So combined, that has all the essential elements, right? Because it is true, you are becoming a child of God. You do receive the Holy Spirit. But neither of those really answer the question of what is baptism. That tells you what it does, but the person would still be like, well, what is it? How do I become a child of God? What is this thing you're talking about? Right? Um, do what? Yeah, wash away the old Adam, right? Combination of water and the word, right? Um, and I do that, I do that to illustrate, because uh, I, I fall prey to this all the time, that we make assumptions about language that we shouldn't. We think, well, everybody kind of knows a baptism. Really don't. <laughs> Even in this context, I have tried to remember the word that I'm going to say. And if I use a word that I think, you know what, did I know that before I went to the seminary? I don't think I did. I'm going to define that for people. Right? Not because they're dumb, but because they didn't go to seminary and they're not a pastor. Right? Just like Lisa probably knows terms about music that she'd say, like, what? What is that? What does that mean? Right? So, in order for that language to be effective, it has to be defined. We have to know what it means. Right? So, baptism is a combination of water and the word where we receive the Holy Spirit and thus become a child of God. Right? That's a pretty good description. Right? Um, what does Luther say at baptism? Is? What is baptism? Let's read it together at the top there. What is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is water included in God's command and combined with God's word. All right, he included one thing in there that we did not. What did he include? And we talked about God's word, was it? God's command. Now, what, how is that different from God's word? We're talking about baptism. Yeah, so we talk about water and the word being combined. We're not talking necessarily about the word of God that commanded us to baptize. We're talking about the word that's combined with the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? But then somebody might ask, well, do I have to do that? The answer is, yeah, you do. It was commanded, right? Um, so we got to make sure we, we make that distinction. Now, um, I'm trying to anticipate your reaction. I think I know what it's going to be about. Because of the no, famous. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, if what someone has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior and has not yet received the baptism, that was know. what I was thinking. Of. Oh, I thought you were talking about <laughs> my other church. No, no, no. That, but that's what I was thinking of. Because that, that's the example. So whenever somebody says you have to be baptized, the almost always the initial reactions. Yeah, but what if? Joey came to faith, he really believes, and was like killed or dies before he could be baptized. What happened? Where does he go? Right. Um, do what? Yeah, right. Well, what's the best example we have of that? Yeah, right. The thief on the cross confesses faith in Jesus, and Jesus says, Today you'll be with me in paradise, right? So, um, but then usually what people then say is they say, ah, see, so baptism is not necessary for salvation. Right. He didn't really have an opportunity. He went lived in other years without doing it. Oh, okay. And, and, so. And the other thing would be is if you truly have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, why would you deny his command? Sure, exactly. Right. So, so the, this hypothetical, which has happened and will happen again, but is rare, is descriptive of baptism, but it's not prescriptive. Okay, so it describes a truth about the scriptures that involves the discussion of baptism, but it doesn't then follow that then you are not required to be baptized. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so if you're curious about the difference between descriptive and prescriptive, you can say um, descriptive is Trish is wearing a green shirt. Prescriptive is thus we should all wear green shirts. Right? So if we're prescribing a rule based off of 
of this example, okay? So baptism is required of the Christian. And it's required of the Christian because Jesus commands that it is. He says we are to be baptized and that we are to baptize as the church. So if it wasn't necessary, God would not have commanded it. But he did, right? And so that's why Luther includes that there sort of as a separate thing. Like it's part of God's word, but it's serving a different function here. Okay. Well, in what context are we talking? Well, if you're not baptized, do you still? So, in the example where you're the thief on the cross and you're dying and you come to faith, yeah. then no, yes. I understand that. Yeah. But I mean, just like the person that Bob was talking about, you know, really believed that he was never baptized. Well, I was, I was thinking that you were going to refer to like a extreme example. Okay. So if the person lives for 30 years as a Christian and refuses to be baptized, I don't know. Because they're they're actively disobeying the command of Jesus. And I can't think of a reason why they would do that. They would have to know they were committed. Yeah. They would have to know they were committed. Yeah, well, presumably to refuse to be baptized for decades while you're a Christian, you'd have to know what baptism is. Otherwise, it's just nobody ever told you, which shame on the church then. But um but typically, if that's the case, if somebody is a, they say they're a believer and they refuse to be baptized, there's some major spiritual issues going on there that, you know, Maybe they don't really believe. It. Yeah. Right. I mean, so I can't say for certain that they're going to hell. I can't say that. I'm not their judge. I don't know their heart. But the, the number, the longer you refuse to be baptized, the number of possible reasons that I would say are legitimate for not being baptized get less and less and less until they pretty much become zero. Um, and, and what happens with the child who no fault of their own is never baptized? So, um, again, that's a similar example. I'm not exactly sure if you're asking this specifically, but that would be a similar example to the thief on the cross. So you're talking okay. about like an unborn child dying or something like that. Well, but or, if there's someone that might be six years old and their parents just aren't believers, well, the child was never baptized. Uh, I mean, the child's probably not a believer because they were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the scriptures say the thing that saves is whether you you believe in Jesus or not, and like that's that's one of the reasons why the command from the church is to go and make disciples. Um, but it also says in the scriptures that if if you do not warn someone of the danger that is coming to them, then I will require that of you. So I mean, that's the parents in this case. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we are so insistent about those things, is to avoid situations. Um, but I would say if you're in a situation, because one of the common situations in America right now is, grandparents who are believers, children who are no longer believers, and because children are no longer believers, their children are not baptized, okay? Um, you are not able to undermine the God-given authority of their parents and smuggle them to be baptized at a church, okay? Because um, that's not your authority, right? But when they're old enough to understand what it is, the Bible gives you no reason why you should honor parents who are actively disobeying God when it comes to baptism, why you shouldn't talk to their kids about baptism. Would that be upper elementary school? Uh, I mean, it just kind of it depends. It's different for each kid, but I mean, generally, I think you can start talking about it, you know, fairly early on. I mean, you're not actively undermining parental authority if you're just speaking to the kids about it, but you can't, like, you can't be like, oh, we're going to go get ice cream and then show up at my office and the pastor baptized my grandson like, where his parent. Well, I don't want them to know. Uh, well, then I'm not going to do it. Um, so uh, I did have a situation like that at my previous church. There was a young man who, uh, and this was where his parents were very in the wrong because he had expressed a desire himself to his grandparents to be baptized. Um, and they prevented it from happening. 
parents. The parents did, yeah. Um, so, I mean, in that case, I would encourage him to find an opportunity to get away from his parents to be baptized, because at that point, if he could speak for himself and express his wishes on his own, he's not beholden to them. Uh, in that case, his parents are abusing their God-given authority against God's will, and therefore no longer applies. Um, so, that's a good question. Would it be prudent or not prudent to talk about Augustine? In what way? In how he got baptized. Oh. Um, I didn't know. I'm not really familiar with that. Um, it... <laughs> It was thought that during baptism, all of your sins were forgiven at that moment. And so they waited until as close to death as they possibly could to get baptized. So they wouldn't have to keep on repenting. Right. And so he was near his deathbed and he goes, I guess it's time for me to get baptized. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that that's based off a historical interpretation of justification that we don't really, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we disagree. Now, yeah. like, are we saying that anyone who doesn't do it the exact way we do it is is just out of luck? No, no, that's not what we're saying. Uh, because as has been illustrated in multiple ways over the last couple of weeks in our Bible study, God is much bigger than us and can operate far outside of our reasoning and understanding. So this isn't the case. Like stuff like baptism is a great example of something given to the church not to induce any sort of despair. Okay. It's meant to encourage in the gospel to be a blessing for God's people. And so we often get lost in the weeds on these really extreme hypothetical examples and in ways actually make an enemy out of baptism, which is not what it's intended to be, right? Um, baptism was made for man, not man for baptism. Right? The same with the Sabbath and the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees tried to turn the Sabbath, which was meant to be a blessing from God, into something that was a burden according to the law. And Jesus proved that by saying, well, which one of you, if your if one of your livestock falls into a well, is just not going to help them out, is going to let them die on the Sabbath. Right? In other words, he's saying the Sabbath was made to serve man and man's needs, not the other way around. Right. Um, so in a weird way, people who like ardently reject baptism have sort of elevated baptism to an idol. Because they're they're basically saying that like well because this is like the end all be all I don't want any part of it because some part of that is going to reject right yeah isn't it sort of analogous to what we were talking about before where we're interposing our own intellectualism and we're saying in effect like well you know that, that can't be right God wouldn't do that and right. it's another one of those you know devil's invitation to say well if I don't if I don't go with it you know it can't be right it can't be right, right. so well, God and, would have to do it this way. As opposed to us making the call for God, and God's yes. going to make the call for some of these things that theologically we don't understand. Yeah, so really the best way to understand the theology of baptism we have is just to believe the words that Jesus said in the Great Commission. And that's it. it. Leave just it there. Do it. Just leave it there. Just do it. So if you have an opportunity to baptize, baptize, right? In accordance with God's will, baptize. Talk about being baptized. Talk about it as an amazing gift from God that, that works the forgiveness of sin, salvation. And brings the Holy Spirit. Because he promises all those things in baptism. Don't I, I think it's one of the best tactics of the devil to get us lost in the weeds on things that God never intended to be about, like God intended certain things never to be about. Baptism is one of those things. He's always like, Well, what happens if this? What happens if this? What happens if this? Like, I don't know, we'll deal with that one at a time when it comes up. But just go baptize and be baptized, right? Um, because he said so. That's it. Right. Yeah. How about people like from hundreds of years ago, or even in the, in, in the middle of nowhere now, who have never ever heard anything about God, but yet know deep down that there is a higher power in control? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 lots of people ask that question, and most of them are shocked. And I just say, I have no idea. I don't know what happened to the indigenous people of the land bridge of Alaska, what is now Alaska, who maybe never had an opportunity to learn about Jesus and lived and died and totally. Oh, I don't know. Let me tell you what I do know. <laughs> that's the that's the redirect there with the last question, by the way. 
She said, I don't know. Well, let me tell you what I do know. Because if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then that includes questions like that. You're like, no, it's his, that's his cake, right? And he knows what he's doing. Because look, look what he did. Look what he's told us. Right? So it's real. I mean, it really does eventually boil down to the question of, are you going to trust yourself in your own reasoning or are you going to trust God? And that's that faith reason thing, right? So Lutherans, that's why we have this interesting dichotomy of we're obsessive about studying scripture in a sort of enlightenment, Western rational sort of way. But we also are insistent that there are things we don't understand from the scriptures that we must hold to because they're there. Because we have to maintain that God's word is above reason. So if there's a clash of God's word and my reason, God's word wins every time. Yeah. And just about the urgency, you know, just think about the urgency of the New Testament, right? Because if we, if we hesitate about, you know, should we, should we send missionaries to all these countries? I mean, look at Paul, look at all these apostles that were risking life and limb. They were traveling the world, right? They're going on ships and they were throwing themselves at the mercy of these communities. They were going into the synagogues that were often hostile to their efforts. You know, they were uprooting power systems of the day they were challenging the the, the authorities the, the the ruling authorities in a way indirectly so i mean clearly god gave them this incredible sense of urgency to go and because they thought you know this is any time now jesus is coming back and we don't want to lose that urgency because we don't know when when, when he's coming right so right right and you can actually you're beginning to see elements of, of in a sense sort of reawakening of that urgency in the west because we, we're really kind of in a new spot as Christians in the West in that um, our culture was so shaped and really born out of Judeo-Christian values that that urgency was lost because you weren't surrounded by people that were constantly speaking against the, the teachings of the scriptures. But the, the devil is, of course, never at rest, and he eventually, over time, he twists things and turns things and alters them slightly. And then you get back again, and this is sort of the cycle of human history, really, if you, if you take history class, or world history class. And, um, and it's really the narrative of the scriptures, too. We all know it's the Old Testament, right? It's like, okay, we, you know, God calls it back to himself. We're faithful for about three seconds. And then we, they fall away and follow after their gods. And then he calls us back again, and we're faithful for about three seconds. And we fall away and follow their gods. And then he calls us back to himself, and we're faithful for about three seconds. I mean, and now we're doing that same loop, but on a weekly basis here in 2022. It sounds like all of the historical books of the Old Testament. <laughs> it really is. Right. And many of them do that cycle like six or seven times in one book, right? And so that, that's where I think this, like we're rediscovering this sense of urgency because we're remembering. I, I mean, imagine if you're a Christian in Ukraine right now or even in Russia. Mm -hmm. Right, all the, the highfalutin academic arguments about baptism they're not having those right they're like okay let's get baptized right let's let's go to church let's worship god because this whole thing might be coming to an end tomorrow. and it's really not coming to an end. it's a new beginning but you know and so like that's why i don't know if you've seen pictures of these. i've seen pictures shared online a few places of people that are like having mass in basements and, like they're going to church while bombs are falling around them because they realize that this is the real thing. Everything else is the stuff that's passing away, including the country that I'm in, the war that's happening around me. Like, you know, and so, and this is really this shift, right? The shift away from the, the centrality of the world in your life to the centrality of God and faith. Right? There's this really, uh, I can't remember the name of the movie. It came out recently. It was about Paul. It was just Paul. Um, but uh, Luke was played by the same guy, Jim Caviezel plays. Jesus and and there's a scene where he's with a bunch of Christians that are below the Colosseum and they're about to be sent out to basically be torn apart by lions for the entertainment of the world. Right? And they're all really scared. And what he does in that scene is he reorients their focus away from the world to God. And he says, if this thing that's about to happen to us, it's but a blip. But what God has given us. And, and that's really like when it comes down to it, when you're, I mean, 
Many of you have had different tragedies that hit you over the past couple of years, different levels of tragedy in life, loss, disease, whatever. In those moments, what do you cling to? God. When everything else gets stripped away, it's God. Right? And that's what we want for other people. That's that urgency. Because the world is a volatile and unpredictable place. It's a sinful and fallen place. And we want them to have that same central, central focus, that central deliverance, that central faith. I like to comment that Protestantism started simultaneous with the very beginning of movable type. It's when books, instead of being written by hand, boom, were printed. And it's simultaneous with the Renaissance. That's why we're having it again now, is the computer. And it's a big part of the reason. Sure. Uh, and Christ, we're getting, Christ is getting out to so many through the computer in like various forms of it. Uh, in the very poor areas of uh, in Southeast Asia, people are given um, what's similar to a phone, but all it has yeah. is, the, is the Bible on it. Right. And they're being given this for free, uh, solar powered. It, the work being spread because of the, 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 the computer and sure. flash phone. And it, it's really opening doors. Well, it's interesting because, like, the, the mediums within a situation change, but the situation itself doesn't really yeah. change. Right? But, and so, like, as Cooper pointed out, that urgency. Maybe something we need to rediscover because the situation in the first century, um, the, you know, the Mediterranean area where they were sending all the, the, the apostles and they were witnessing and the church was growing, it's the same now as it was then. Sinful world in need of a savior. And I don't know the day or the hour. Christ is coming back. And he's given the church a directive. To, to go and, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach everything I can and, and he's going with you to do that. So, you know, that's that's what this these sort of Bible studies, that's the reason we're even here. And the reason we're here studying the word is to be reoriented every time we do, away from what we're tempted to, to focus on, which is the world. Um, okay. Uh, two after. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, we'll just do this baptism is not just plain water part. I, I sort of ambitiously included the second part, pretty much assuming we weren't going to get there. But, um, <laughs> so, okay, um, so if you, uh, unless you wrote on your, your sheet, which is fine if you did, keep it. If you didn't, you can put it back on the table and you leave the keys in next week. Okay, baptism is not just plain water. The word baptize means to wash. It does not specify the form or mode of washing, okay? Um, so look at those passages. Someone want to do Mark 7, verse 4. I'm going to close with this thought. I have it. All right, Laura, you'll read that for us. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and the table. Okay, so in that in that verse, they're clearly not talking about baptism as we understand it, but the same word that is used in the scriptures for baptism is used there to describe that washing. Um, somebody have the Acts 1 verse 5? Sure. Okay, go ahead. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, so uh, this means that like if uh, you want to get baptized in a murky pond, or in a dirty river, or with me throwing water at you from six feet away because of COVID, or um, just splashing water on your head from the baptismal font, as is our normal practice. Are all those valid forms of baptism? Yes. Yeah, they are. Right? So that's why we don't really get hung up on any particulars of that. Some people do. They they really insist you need to be you need to be fully submerged or whatever. You know, if you want that, if it's a barrier for you. Uh, personally, I'll do that. I don't mind dumping people, but um, it's not necessary. Uh, so that's sort of a discretionary thing. Um, so, like, if you really don't want to get baptized in the church building, and you know you want to be out in nature or whatever, sure, I'll baptize you. Um, I just got to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Um, so. All right, it is the word of God that gives baptism its divine power. So 
if that's the truth, who's doing the work in baptism? God. God is, right? And it's important you understand that because the people who don't practice infant baptism, that do rebaptisms, disagree. They believe that the power of baptism is in your own confession of faith, that you're making a public confession of faith, a public commitment to follow God. We think that's pretty pointless because our public commitments about faith are pretty trashy. They don't last very long. Right? Um, and so baptism is talked about as this amazing comfort, gospel promise, because it's not based on your commitment. Anything based on your commitment is not a gospel promise that is really worth holding on to because our commitment is pretty bad. Right? Um, so that is an extremely important distinction. It also helps you understand maybe if you have family members or friends who aren't having their kids baptized until they're eight. Because if, if it's about your commitment to God, can an infant make a commitment to God? No, right? So the reason that we baptize infants is because we believe that's not really what's happening here. It's God making a commitment to you. He's placing his name on you. But the best way to think about it is an adoption, right? When a child is adopted, does the child choose the people who adopt it? No. The people adopting the child choose that child, and then they place their name on that child as one of their own, right? That's what's happening to you in baptism, right? That's why the parable of the prodigal son is so profound, right? Is it exemplifies the fact that the father is faithful and your identity in his eyes does not change, which is why it is such a sorrowful thing for him if you do not return. He doesn't lose some person that he sort of picked up off the side of the road. He loses a child. Right? And so when you do come back, even if you've got a great speech prepared about how you're going to be a servant, he's going to hug you, put a robe on you, and throw a party because his child is alive in return. Right? Um, and that's what's going on in baptism. Um, and that, that also can be a key difference in a conversation you're having with somebody who is against baptism, because a lot of people who have baggage about baptism believe that it's some form of indoctrination of the church that sort of imprisons you in something. Okay? Um, and part of that is because they believe it's the sort of outward commitment that you're making that you have to live up to. And that's really not what it's intended to be. The jailer and his family is a perfect example to use for people who only believe in adult baptism. Oh, yeah, yeah. his kids. You know? Right, the whole household. Yeah. Yep. Household uh, includes children. Okay, baptism, like all the means of grace, is intended to comfort sinners and give them certain hope of everlasting life. So the reason I included that is, again, to emphasize, it's not for stuffy, weird, hypothetical academic debate. It's not the purpose of baptism. You can have those things. When they arise, but when you're talking to somebody about baptism, it should be a positive affirmation sort of speech. Right? We've, we've sort of fell into this as the church in general in the last like half century, maybe longer, where people find out about what we believe by us defining what it isn't. Well, marriage is not this. Marriage is not that. Baptism is not this. Baptism is not that. Communion is not this. Communion is not that. Well, let's talk about what it actually is. So when you're talking about somebody with baptism and maybe they're not really sure what it is or they're unsure about whether or not they want to, just describe to them what they are getting. What does baptism do? What is it? And let that speak for itself. The Word of God has been around a long time and it'll be around a long time more. It doesn't need you to defend it. It can speak for itself. Right? I think it's, it's helpful to think of baptism Supper together because the Lord's Supper, at least to me, is much it's much more clear to me that it's God doing the work. Given, poured out, you know, the, the words that are there are all what God's doing. Yeah. So with baptism, like the words feel a little more nebulous because you've got sponsors reciting the creed. It it, it feels a little more like this is this is actually one of my irritations with the the way that they always set up baptism in like official church document is it's all they sort of like combine it with confirmation um, and 
when the way when when a church is when a congregation is catechized properly, they'll understand that the people that are answering those questions in this case are the parents, and the parents aren't saying that their child cognitively understands all the things we're speaking on his behalf. But what we're saying is that we're bearing witness to their faith, which is this, right? Um, the probably the best language example I can give you is when the baptism actually happens. The pastor is saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who is I? No, it's God. Oh, okay. Right? So my job is to be his spokesperson. I'm his, I'm his vessel. So in baptism, people say, oh, thank you so much for baptizing your kid. I'm like, oh, I have hands and a mouth. That's all I do. Um, it's God speaking when he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't have the authority to put his name on anyone. Only he. It's like I can't I can't force you to adopt someone. Well, I think, I, I, I think it's harder as, as a congregant sitting there with either participating in communion or watching baptism. Communion um, feels more um, God's doing like all a reception. The work. Yeah. And baptism doesn't always feel that way, which is why I think it's helpful to think of just the parents like sure. yeah well and that's the purpose of you talking about the means of grace and the sacraments the means of grace are the means by which god brings his grace to us right um, and so that's why they both fall in the same category but really i think the catechetical part is is probably the primary of primary importance regardless because we had a lot of questions about different elements of the lord's supper last week and we're, that were demonstrative of the fact that the church is been very confusing at the very least in the way that it's talked about what exactly is going on here, right? Uh, and so um, that's one of the reasons that we go through this stuff when we go to Bible study is so that there can be some clarity there, especially where clarity is given, right? Um, and so I, I do agree. I think they, they are. That's the reason they're sort of taught together, right? is that they're they're the same sort of they have the same sort of function. In church. Okay, I. I, I I think I noticed the hands and stuff, but we're going to have to close there um, because we're already 15 minutes after. So um, thanks for sticking around, even though it was a little long. Sorry about that. Um, and let's, pray, let's close the word. Dear Holy Father, we just ask for your grace, mercy, and forgiveness. As you're stubborn and, and wayward people at times, we get so easily distracted and led astray by the enemy in our own sin and flesh. But thank goodness for Jesus Christ, for now we can rest in the grace of your forgiveness and know that you continually send us your word to reorient us back to you, to gather us back to you so that we can do what you have given the church to you, to baptize this great and wondrous gift you've given us as an outward sign of your commitment to us, the thing that happens in time and space that we can remember and draw hope and security from when a lot of things are not going well in our lives. Thank you for that. Continue to bless our study of that, that part of your word, and that gift you've given the church, so that it may continue to be something that we are able to speak of in wondrous terms um, and share with others, so that they too may experience the joy of being your child. Bless us this week. Um, watch over us with your word and send your spirit to be with us as we go out and do the tasks you've called us to do. In your name we pray. Amen.